Okay. Um, I just, as you can see, I just upload um, the, um, the I I'll call it a partial implementation of the uh, homework assignment number four I presented last time with all the classes and uh, uh, some of the test program. Um, so just let you know what happened is if you look at what we did for this communication chart, um, essentially the program attached to you implement the first three message, the possession and detachment, how would that work? So um, it essentially has all the classes like what we have presented here. I, I did change a little bit uh, from the expiration. I changed to the name expirable. So there's still the same uh, inheritance class, uh, but it's just, just the name. I changed a little bit. Um, and let me go back to show you what happened. Just a second. Uh, it must be here. No, not here. Over here. Wait a minute. Where is that? Okay, here. Under this directory, CPP06, uh, it has all, all the file and I update the make file. You can see that uh, we have the every single class. You can, you can every single uh, C++ class that uh, during the last lecture we presented. Um, so if you um, do a make, it will, it will compile everything. Um, and then if you run the program, it will start running. And, and let me just tell you what happened is in the first few uh, events. So the first event, if you look at this, the first three event is uh, the first three event were possession that the target like uh, possess this box of beer. And then at some point, because there was a transaction, is it represent the ownership transfer from uh, a target to the customer. So that's why they have two events recorded. One is detachment, one is possession. Uh, so you, you, can, you can see the, the first event is possession, is a box of beer, and then the, the time was, okay, there is, by the way, the beer has an expiration time, okay? When the, the beer will still be good to use in this case, uh, and and then this happened, uh, possession happened about November 1st. So it means November 1st, this box of beer got delivered to um, uh, Target. And, and then uh, where it is, uh, uh, this is uh, Target's uh, GPS location. Uh, and wait a minute. Oh, sorry, I have to go, go back a little bit. So this is the first event possession and it has target like, and who is this? This is the person, remember we said it's an agent. So this one is a, in fact, is an agent, it's, it's called target like. And then there is at, at uh, okay, this, this time was November 1st, but then by November 6th, that this is called detachment, uh, is still the box of beer, still the same thing. Uh, and, and then uh, essentially uh, this is the same person. It's just the label of the record is detachment. I'm detaching myself from this box of beer. And then there was a possession happened. Uh, just watch out is exactly the same time. This time is November 6th at four o'clock. And so this is another new possession is, uh, is also the same time at the November 6th, uh, four o'clock. And however, this possession changed location from target to another location is over here. By the way, this is illegal at UC Davis. UC Davis, you cannot have any alcohol uh, beverage before 5 p.m. Do, do you know the rule? If you want to have a beverage uh, alcohol on campus, any room, you have to apply for a license. And uh, uh, you have a limit. I, I, I did that once, by the way, because I host the event. I, 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 I have about 40, 50 guests. So I, I said, well, how many uh, bottles of red wine can I, can I do? He said, you know, you can have only four person a bottle. Okay, that's the license. I still have that license when I host that event. Okay, so just to let you know, this I probably shouldn't pick a, a TLC. I should probably 
pick up something else outside the campus, as an example. So you can see that now who is actually transferred to Felix to me. Okay, so that that's kind of you can you can create this class and describe the. Uh, by the way, this is what we tried to do. If you if you remember what we did last time, um, this is the description. What we like to have, we would like to have all kind of uh, um, um, uh, operation for tracking thing, including possession, check in, detaching, uh, co ownership, and the login. And this is the scenario uh, that uh, I I kind of implement partially. I implement the the beer, but I didn't implement the the laptop part. Okay, and then you can see that this is the the situation that you can you can uh, play around with. Okay, so but by the way, um, in in the opportunity programming, um, a lot of time for you to de develop your idea to see that what kind of object, what kind of class, they're really really useful for you to take care of the things you like. It's it's really coming from a kind of natural language, a kind of description what you want, and then you try to. Uh, convert that particular paragraph you try to do into something which is like what kind of classes you want and then you come up with a set of top. By the way, this particular one is not a unique uh, solution. It has a lot of pro and cons. I will present to you, I said, well, this way design, it might not be the best way to do what we want to do. By the way, this is a great if you want to implement a centralized control. So mean, mean, meaning that I show you three record, if there is somebody at a centralized server keep tracking all the record, it makes sense to use this design. That means that somebody has to watching all of us about what beer you bought and uh, what, what kind of food you consume or where you go. And this basically understand, uh, sorry, understanding some kind of surveillance for you to watch out for the whole thing because it's called record. Record is a logging for you to record everything. And later I'm going to show you another design, which is uh, user centric. Means that this information is all in the possession about each individual person, but still we will be able to do the things that equivalent to this one. Okay, so uh, so just just before I start moving that direction, I want to tell you that uh, so under this directory you have all the all the uh, source code uh, for only. Uh, let me show you what what the what the test. This is the driver test homework for uh, CPP. If, if you look at this, I include everything, and then you should be familiar with this at this moment. You can see that I'm using uh, label GPS uh, to define uh, TLC and the target, and also the, the person and the agent that's included. And then you can see that I have uh, uh, the consumable, which is a beer. And uh, by the way, the consumable currently, uh, every time it, it is created the, the remaining, which one of the variable, why is it consumable? Hold on. You can take a look at here. Consumable is really just have a two extra stuff. Okay, one extra stuff is remaining. Okay, about about uh, uh, what is, uh, how, how much of the portion of the, the product is still remain. It's a model as a floating point from zero to one, just, just let you know that. Um, but, but this one basically describe all the timestamp. And then I start to create a record. The first record is possession. The second record is detachment. The third record is possession and that's it. And then I just print three record using uh, dump to JSON. So, so this just give you some basic idea that you can follow up and then try to extend and then try to create whatever uh, uh, record you would like to represent the whole uh, the whole uh, scenario. So why this exercise is important? Because through this exercise, not only you kind of learn uh, some basic about object-oriented design and object-oriented programming, but also you learn when you need to update your design. So when, when I give you this code, for example, the next event, if you take a look at this here, the next event, the next event should be co-ownership. 
So meaning that you invite a friend to come to your house and then you try to uh, have them to have access to the product such as a laptop or a box of beer that they can they can uh, enjoy. So you need to add the co-ownership into uh, the, the, the event. And how do you do that? I mean, the, the, the good thing is that everything has been in vector. So everything have a record has multiple person, but how do you differentiate a primary uh, holder and the, the I would call the co-holder or co-ownership so they can enjoy only? And how do you make sure that your design will reflect exactly what you want to do in this diagram? So this diagram, I show you both the, um, both the inheritance hierarchy and containment hierarchy and also communication diagram. This three thing, there are multiple names to describe this. Some of the tool might merge, combine two of them. But in my experience, usually it's better to separate them into these three. One just to describe inheritance hierarchy, just describe the relationship among all the classes. So you know what you have and how they're related to each other regarding inheritance. And containment hierarchy is really describing the attribute you need to define. So, Containment hierarchy usually is equivalent to your .h file. The .h file usually include all the all the attributes. So some sometimes you might not need to have a containment hierarchy, but instead you can uh, just design the .h file because .h file typically is much smaller. The .cpp file because it has a lot of implementation and computational logic, so it's a lot longer. But the .h file sometimes is easier to have. And, and the important thing is about this communication diagram. Communication diagram is basically talk about the real action, the kind of action that the object, they need to interact with each other. So in this case, we have a target-like box of beer customer and a friend. And you can see that we have a person object. We have a, a consumable mean thing object. And, and they're, they're connecting. And sometimes you need to involve other objects such as uh, GPS and timestamp that sometimes you might not be able to represent with a line, but you can show their uh, um, existence under each of the arrow that's actually being passed by. So uh, one thing I didn't do well is that I just say that's a possession, but I didn't say what is the attribute need to be associated with that particular uh, possession relationship among those, okay? So I will just let you play around with this for a while, and then I will first talk about the next topic, and then I will come back to see uh, after you have done something, then I will try to extend this to tell you the next level uh, about what's the alternative design that you can have. Okay, All right, so I'm going to, Hold down, wait a minute, where's my PowerPoint file? Let me get to my PowerPoint. <clears throat> One second, uh, let me do a... Which one was this? Sorry, let me take a look. Which one? I need to give it. Okay, I want to talk about this one. Yes. So the the subject I would like to introduce next. There are two subjects. One is I call it a, a remote procedure call, and the other. One is called uh, distributed object. So they are related. Um, uh, think about this way. When I describe to you, assuming this is the product, assuming this is the product you bought from Target. Um, so from object-oriented programming perspective, that this bottle is information you need to store somewhere. And remember I said, you might have a server that's actually store everything. But we're, we're assuming usually that all the objects are under one server. So you basically just run the program within that server. 
But in reality, we found out that uh, from the programmer's perspective, this sometimes is undesirable because sometimes I want to store whatever product I bought when I go to Target. I want to store the product on my phone, which the Target has their own server keep some other information. So for example, I show it to you the possession and detachment. So what detachment really are talking about is that this particular object is detaching from target and then under my possession in TLC. So you can see that physically that's happening, it means that your object could potentially move around from the space, from one physical location to the other. Okay, this capability uh, is useful when you want to deal with an application, you consider that your information, your object is really, really proximity to the physical object you have. So, so, so now I'm going to introduce a, a, a little bit uh, a new concept. By the way, this could be really significant for, for C++ or any object or programmer. Um, it's usually we think we have a physical world and then we have an object-oriented world. So we collect all the object-oriented stuff under one cyberspace, cloud, mainframe, or whatever computer. And so whatever I want to represent the physical world, I just basically run everything, looks like a simulation or emulation on my uh, cyber world. So we, we, we separate the physical and the cyber completely. Well, the thing you say in reality, the physical sometimes need to be really close to the cyber. So it means that I'm going to break vertically. So if I have an object called, say, a bottle object or, or, or expirable object, then I want this physical stuff will expire is attaching to the cyber expirable object. This makes a lot of sense. If, if this is a bottle of beer, not bottle of beer, bottle of milk, and it will expire usually how long uh, this can, can hold? Probably three weeks, four weeks. If you go to uh, Safe Mart, uh, which that's where I, I went uh, last night. Uh, and then I checked the timestamp. Okay, I checked the timestamp. It will be nice if I really have an object that's actually attached to this physical object. So essentially I have all the information, all the computation, I can really convene it, no matter where that where 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 this go, because when I purchase this bottle of milk and put it in my refrigerator, now is my refrigerator is actually doing object in the programming with this bottle of milk is coming. Okay, so this this is essentially we try to vertically break and such that you will be able to do object in the programming when 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 you look at the physical space really close to the cyberspace individually in for each of the object. Okay, that, that is something which I want to introduce. So, so in order to do that, uh, I'm introducing two concepts. One concept is called remote procedure call. The second concept is called distribute the object. Okay, distribute the object. So let me, let me first talk about what is a remote procedure call. So you probably know uh, procedure call or sometimes we call a function call. So function call is you have a function. In this case, uh, I want to call a function, which is this function is called foo, right? This is a function here. So I write a piece of program. I have a place which I define the function foo. And then I basically call that function at some point. And the traditional way of doing programmer uh, programming, uh, essentially you need to put this two thing in the same executable. They might not be in the same uh, source code file, but they have to be linked together and such that you became a executable file so you can run that program. So that's, that's a typical, what we call procedure call, okay? Uh, uh, that, that's a typical way. So, okay, what's remote procedure call? Remote procedure call is essentially I have a two program. I have a two separate executable they got compiled and linked separately. And such that I break that relationship on the top, such that when I try to call the function, the function is in one program. 
And when they call this program, instead of try to find a local copy here, you try to find a remote place that's actually have that function. And then you will call that function. Okay, so that's the that's the basic concept about remote procedure call. That how do you call uh, a function that's across a boundary of S as as a program? Okay. Um, any question with this figure? Yes. Oh, uh, that that's just an example. The the it's just say that function returns a pointer to a double, but but you can you can. Um, do any kind of integer, any kind of function signature. Yeah. Okay. Any any other question you have about remote procedure call? Okay. So, in fact, you already uh, um, have 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 already download the the library and the include file that enable to you for you to use this immediately. Okay. So that's that's a lot of things in the. Um, in the um, RPC, uh, RPC. If you, if you, some of you might remember that when you look at the main file for the earlier homework, you include something called JSON RPC CPP. So there's a JSON CPP means that it's a JSON, sorry, a, a C plus plus implementation of a JSON. But the other one is called JSON RPC CPP, which means that it's is is basically supporting a JSON flavor of remote procedure call under C++. Okay, so it works, looks like this. In order for this two program to work together, you have to define the interface. It's pretty much like what we define a object-oriented program, which define, you know, what's the, uh, what's the, um, uh, what's the member function to allow you to access to that. So essentially you need to have some way to define the interface between the client and the server is such that you will be able to let it communicate. Okay, and, and the, that interface typically, by the way, the, the first generation RPC, they're using something called XDR. XDR, I forgot what it is. Uh, uh, oh, I have to Google it, XDR, a long time ago, I remember, used to remember that. But the, the newer uh, uh, RPC, uh, there are multiple one, but one of them, the most popular one is JSON based. So they use JSON to describe the interface. So, so this is the way it will work, it looks like this. So essentially you define the interface. I'll, I'll show you some example uh, about how the client and server need to talk to each other. And, and the thing is that that interface will go through a program called JSON RPC stuff. Essentially, it's looking at the interface you declare as the as the um, as the um, uh, interface uh, declaration, and then they will take that program to automatically generate code. It will generate uh, two pieces of code. One piece of code is a client side. It's called client.h, and uh, uh, some kind of client.cpp depending on what how you specify. And over here, it will define also the server.h and the a template for server.cpp. And what you what you will see is that you really have to, based on the client.h, client.h, by the way, is generated, uh, server.h is generated, but the rest of the code, you have to fill up the, the gap. And when you fill up the gap, and then this code, will be linking to the library that related to the, the JSON RPC CPP, and it will deliver the code to call this. So essentially using this, uh, what we call the RPC stub generator, and then you will be able to uh, create a distributed object very easily. Okay. So let, let's, let's take a look at some example to see how, that, how this work. <clears throat> Let me pick up one of the program. So I'm going to use one of the program called Web Report. 
So you can see, uh, oh, hold on one second. Let me do a make clean, make. Okay, I have a linking problem, but that's okay. I want to show you what is ethereum 36 b uh, hw3.json. Okay, you can see that I create uh, a few functions. So this place I create the first function is called get distance. So this portion, by the way, if you uh, can see the, the, the character on the screen, that this is an array. This is a JSON array. And this is a one element from this array. And this, this is what we call interface. By the way, I could find multiple uh, function that's allow both the client server to communicate. Um, and uh, one of the function, the first function is, is called uh, get distance. You can see that get distance is related to, I want to call a GPS object remotely. Okay, I want to call a GPS object because GPS object has this get distance to see the distance between these two. So, um, so essentially I have to define when I make the call called get distance, what are the parameter, what are the uh, um, uh, argument I need to provide for that function? So in this case, I have a multiple of them that's included. Uh, but this is purely the programmer's choice. This particular example, I have six arguments I need to pass from the client to the server. So, so when I say client to a server, I just want to mention to you for this particular uh, figure. So um, when you have a remote procedure call setting, uh, let me use this one, it's probably easier. So under the setting, you can see that this is where the function really sit in. Okay, the function is running here, but the caller, try, whoever trying to call is from this side. So in this case, we say this is the client and this is a server. So server is basically serving whoever. So this program might have, you might have 10 million client here, would like to call this function. Okay, in some sense, why would call a client server? You can think about this as just like a website. So this is the web server that has a functionality to respond to a lot of requests about how you want to access this particular web server. And this is a web browser. So this is usually we say this is a client and this is a server. Okay. Um, let me go back to the example. Okay, so in this case, that you will have a name of the function. Uh, so both sides will know what's the name of the function. And then you have a bunch of uh, parameter that you want to go in. And then you want to say, well, what kind of things I need to return? So I return a bunch of things as well. So essentially the interface basically just find the function signature about that particular uh, function call you have. So earlier, I think, uh, I, I forgot your name, sorry. Uh, you asked about why is double star. Right? Double star is essentially uh, some kind of return value that you can specify to return that. Okay, so let, let's take a look at what is, okay, based on the signature, let's take a look at um, WR, Klein, H. So this program, remember, if I show you earlier over here, I said, you go through a program called JSON RPC stuff is generating the client.h and the server.h. So I'm going to show you the, the those two files that's like a generate under this, this particular uh, situation. So first let's take a look at the client, client side. Okay, this client, if you look at the first three lines over here, it says that what? It says that this file is generated by JSON RPC stuff. Do not change it manually. This is not what I wrote there, is the RPC compiler. It basically generates this code and advise you this code is completely generated. Why, why is that? Because if you modify the interface, Whenever you modify that JSON file, I show you like a five second earlier, if you made any changes, 
this will trigger the compiler to recompile this the whole file. And therefore, you're going to generate somewhat slightly different. So changing over here doesn't make sense because it will it will uh, just uh, override whatever you have. Okay, so now let's take a look at this this code. So this code is essentially right now I define because I call this file uh, wr client. So it's called class. It create a, a class called wr client. And then when you look at this, this inheritance. It inherit from JSON RPC client. JSON RPC is uh, a class that related when you uh, include this library, when you want to use a remote procedure call. So it basically inherit from there. And the first function over here is the uh, WR client. Okay, and then it starts to have a bunch of uh, function. Web report is one of the function. Uh, by the way, how come there's only one function over here is inconsistent? Sorry, let me check the server side. Did I use the wrong one? No, it's the same thing. Okay, so I use the wrong R JSON file. Uh, oh, I know, I look at the wrong file. You see that I have another file. This is a file that I really want to show you. I shouldn't show you the homework three file. I should just show you this one, 36D wr.json. Okay, this one is, is just one function called web report. Okay, that, that file is related to this. You can see that now it's a simplify. Okay, this is much better than what I, what I showed you earlier. That again, this is a JSON array to define the protocol between the client server. But in this function, but in this particular interface, there is only one function I care. It's called uh, web report. And the web report, the name of the function is called web report. The parameter is just uh, very simple. One is called action, one is called uh, JSON. I, I just basically, I do only need two parameters for this simple case. And then the return, when you do a web report, it will return a, a JSON and with an action as well. So you can see that you can find as simple as one or two argument versus you have six argument and four function in the, in the previous one. So this is the web report. So, okay, now I can go to this one. It will make sense. Okay, no, I want to show you the client first. Okay, so this is a client that generate by the, uh, the web report uh, .json. So it only have one function and that one function is called web report. Okay, so essentially this, this code is generated. So when you want to do the remote procedure call, you really just call this function web report that's produced and this will send the report to uh, the other side. So let me, let me tell you that why it is. Uh, if you look at what's happening here, inside this web report is doing two things. One is I have to encode every single parameter. So just take a look what I encode the parameter. Is this familiar to you, this three line? It should be familiar to you. This is similar to what you have been doing with the dump to JSON. So essentially I create a JSON object called P and then I encode, I set P action because a two parameter, one parameter is called action, the other parameter is called your JSON. So essentially I put, because when you call it, you provide two uh, JSON, uh, two argument. One is the first one is action, the string. The second one is also a string. I essentially encode it into a JSON. So the action is equal to this string you just pass in and your JSON is equivalent to uh, your JSON, another string, As, assuming you have a two string. And after you've done this, you just essentially call this method. You say this call method web report, uh, comma P. And then you just call that method and this essentially help you to deliver to the server who will be receiving the call. So, so essentially it will generate the call that eventually doing only two things. The first thing is help you to package the parameter together. And the second, it will generate the code to say what is the, the, the function that you need to call, which is a web report using this method, general method called call method. 
And then the result you're getting from this call, because when you call the server, server is going to return, and then it will give you this result back. Okay, and then uh, basically you can do a, a little bit thing. And then if there's something wrong with the result, then you're going to generate some exception, which exceptional handling is something I would like to talk about later. Okay, this is just the client side. Now I want to show you the test program so you can see how this particular WR client. But I just want to you to remember one thing at this moment. Um, remember this function called web report. And it take a two argument, one is action, one is your JSON, and then it will return a JSON value. It will return a, a, a JSON object for that particular call. Okay, so let's take a look at the client.cpp. Okay, so this is the program that's going to leverage the client program I just showed you. And how how do you get that? Okay, so the way it works is really like your web browser. So we're doing a web browser instead of for you to uh, uh, type in certain thing into your Google Chrome or your whatever uh, browser you're using Safari. Um, instead of that, you're using a program to do this. So what you what you should be doing is okay. You can see that the before the main program is all about some include file, but notably you have to include this two file. One is the wr client.h, which you just did. And another program you need to include is the HTTP client, because this is a client program to do this uh, remote procedure call, you need to include that HTTP client. Okay, so over here, you can see this, what we did here is, uh, first I have to set up my HTTP client and I set to be a localhost 830. So you can see this one is essentially what we call a URL. URL is a uh, URL universal record locator. Uh, so if you see a link, I don't know if you're familiar with this, this location. So this is either HTTP or HTTPS. Uh, and that basically provide a link for you to access any web resources on the network. So we're just using this same format for us to communicate with the server. So when you describe this, this particular URL, uh, let me take a look at this. So this one is, everything is a local. So I'm saying HTTP local colon 8300. That means I'm actually running the server on the same program on my local host. So, both the server and client are running on the same host. Then I use a local host. However, I can do something different. Like in this case, I run it against a server that's actually on the other side of the world. And then I basically just provide a URL. So you set the URL to say where the server is that you're trying to communicate with. Okay, so you, you, you look at this line, and you also create, this is what? This is a constructor. You, you create the object called my client, and that is the web client that you just created, okay? These two are basically set up the communication paths with the remote server. So after you have done this, the rest is just configure the parameter, okay? You don't have to worry about this part, but over here, you can see that I said what? Result is equal to my client, to call to the web report. So essentially, let me go up a little bit to make sure you can see both parts. Okay, so watch for this, this three, this, this three line, this two line and this line. Okay, so this two line, the first line I show you is just create the uh, HTTP universal record locator about where the other part is. And the second line is when you want to create a web client using the WR client, which is defined, let me just, just bring up the code, uh, WR client.h. When you do the WR client, WR client is a class. And remember the constructor to construct with this two uh, um, uh, argument. So you can see that he, now what I did is I just using the WR client to create an object called my client. And under the my client, the first argument is HTTP client. 
which is the URL you just created. Okay, so this is essentially, this, this line is correspond to this line. Okay, so after you've done this two line, essentially, you already have all the, provide all the information from the communication perspective to the server on the other program. All right, if your URL is provided correctly, and then what you will do next, sorry, I have to go over here. Now what you're doing here is at some point after you process the parameter, you say my client.web report. My client was an object you just created and you call this function web report. And look at this, you have like a two argument that's, I don't want to go into the semantic detail, but both of them are string. And those strings are passed into here and they will be sent to the server side to be processed, okay? So let me quickly, uh, we only have a two minutes. I want to quickly go over the server side. So on Wednesday, we can look into uh, a program step-by-step uh, -step more in detail, okay? So now let's look at the server side. So the server side, again, it will say that this file is generated and don't change it. And it create a server, uh, a class called WR server. And this inherited from JSON RPC abstract server, WR server. By the way, uh, if you look at, anytime you look at a class or, or any kind of function or data structure with a greater than and smaller than, this is usually we call a template. We call a template. Template is a very important topic we haven't talked about, but we will cover exception and template are two topics we will uh, handle toward uh, the end of the quarter. And with the WR server, you can see that there is a bunch of things. Also, they have a constructor, but the important thing is that it has this function, and this function is a virtual function. It's a virtual function called web report. So what happened is that the client has a, has a call, web report will call Mesa, and that Mesa will eventually be delivered over here to call this web report. All right, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's essentially the mechanism of how we will handle going to here. Okay, so I want you to take a look at one thing. If you look at just this line, I want you to take a look at this line. What kind of things is new to you about the syntax, about this particular line? I mean, you know virtual, right? You know the keyword virtual, you know the uh, data type JSON value, okay? So the new thing must be somewhere over here. Anything that's actually particularly unfamiliar? Or, or, or I would say it's kind of uh, interesting or strange for that portion I just highlight. Yes. Okay, the, 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 the answer I hope you can get is equal to zero. Now why, you, you have never seen, I did, uh, we did a, a C++ uh, uh, declaration but at the end, I put an equal to zero. Okay, so let me tell you what is equal to zero. It's equal to zero is what we call a technical term called pure virtual function. So you learn virtual function, and now I introduce you something called pure virtual function. So I will start to look into what is a pure virtual function on Wednesday. Okay, 